Hi, I'm Maria Thea Harris or Velo Sews on social media. Welcome back to Sew Over 50 Podcast. Grab a cuppa and relax with us. Sew Organised Style Podcast acknowledges traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to the Elders past, present and emerging. Welcome back to Sew Over 50 Podcast on Sew Organised Style. It's a new year with more people from the sewing community to keep you company and make you smile. So over 50 intersects with all communities. Many thanks to everyone who has listened to Sew Organised Style podcast. In December last year, the podcast hit an amazing milestone, 1 million downloads. The podcast was downloaded over 1 million times. As Sally Field once said, you really, really like this podcast. Well, you get the idea. For over two years, Robin, Blanca, Vero, Amy, Robbie, Helen, Elizabeth, Anouk, Megan, Marie and James have contributed in their own way to help the podcast through Patreon. They keep the podcast going and I really, really appreciate everyone's support. With COVID affecting us all in some way, shape or form, I hope So Organised Style Podcast has brought your sewing friends to you and has made you smile. My aim for the podcast is to keep bringing you people from the sewing community that keep you company. There will be more so over 50 follower guests on the podcast to support the hard work that our fearless so over 50 leaders, Judith and Sandy, do every day on Instagram. As well, we're going to bring back Susan Young, the official blog writer for So Over 50, for a few more podcasts again this year. The So Over 50 community is a cheer squad of over 39,000 followers and counting. Let's get back to hearing part two of Mimi Jackson's interview you heard last year. In this podcast, you'll hear about Mimi's sewing passion, how she creates garments with care, humour and a lot of love. Mimi Jackson runs the Instagram and blog called Shop the Garment District. Make sure you go back and listen to her first podcast. Thanks for being today's Sew the 50 guest, Mimi. Oh, thank you. When did you first start sewing? I probably started around the age of 10 or so, and I started to make clothing for my dolls, you know, for Barbie dolls. And I used tube socks first and made tube sock dresses, which is very simple. I mean, it's really just making it narrow enough and (laughs) going straight up the back. You know, when people play basketball and they have the socks that have the stripes at the top. So that's what I would do. And the stripes at the top were always part of the design of the dress. (laughs) So I made lots of doll dresses out of tube socks. And then I started making other things because once I got a handle on a needle and thread, yeah. I started to just make more things. And it didn't matter that I didn't know how. I just made things. There was no, in quotes, how. It was just, I think I'll make this. I think I'll use this or that. And uh, it just became something that I started to do. And at that time, Were you only using a needle and thread or when did you end up using a sewing machine? I was probably 14 or 15 when I started using a sewing machine. My mother had a great big monster of a machine. I don't know what brand it was, the kind that's in the table and it has the knee. It was really quite an industrial piece of machinery and I never used it because I was intimidated by it and also that was what she used. She liked to sew. A lot. She didn't like to finish things, but she really enjoyed (laughs) sewing. (laughs) There were many things, many things we bought patterns for that never actually materialized, but we enjoyed the process of starting. (laughs) That's great. What is your textiles background? Can you talk us through that? It's quite long. You ready for it? (laughs) Yeah, go for it. Um, Okay. Textiles and fashion together have been my interests for a long time. When I was a teenager, I had a very special opportunity to work for a high-end designer boutique here in New York. And I loved it, absolutely loved it. Doing that job opened the door to a couple of other things. I worked for an import-export company as soon as I graduated from college. Mm -hmm. In that import-export company, I learned a lot about importing and exporting fabrics as well. And then I went from there to a textile company and I was the export person for that textile company. Okay. Then I went from there to another textile company 
that also did high-end fashion, but they were completely vertical. So they produced both the fabric and all of the garments and everything that they made out of that. And so from there, I still interested in textiles and fashion. The next job I got, I worked for one of the big four pattern companies because I was making things all the time while I was at work. And my coworkers would always say, I think you're in the wrong profession <laughs> because I was so fascinated by it. And it just so happened that I interviewed for one of the big four pattern companies and I got the job and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I would have done it forever. Mm -hmm. The only reason I stopped was because they had a wage freeze. And they started letting go of people. And as much as I loved it, I needed to earn more and build a life. And so I left there because I had the opportunity to do so. And I, I went to a different job that paid a lot more. But even though it, the new job had nothing to do with garment or fashion at all, where was the company located? Right in the heart of the garment district. Oh. So I would take lunch <laughs> and leave and be in the middle of everything I love. And then go back to that job after lunch. And I still had my toe in the garment and fashion world because I was so into it. And so over time, that kind of took over. And it was an, as an unusual turn of events because I became pregnant with my first child. And my father was simultaneously diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, which was a very sad thing. But that changed my mind. I became... My, my mother is still with us, but I became a caregiver and also when I had a baby. So that was, you know, that's basically what happened. So mm -hmm. then when I started doing that, I was also on the side making things for people. Whenever I had a free moment, I was making things for people and that started to become my profession. I was custom sewing for clients and they just never stopped coming. So I just kept doing that. <laughs> and it's been a long time since then. I had made things for people before that. It wasn't my first go at it. I started that basically in high school, but it was never my profession until after my daughter was born. And then ever since now, it's been what I've done with yep. other little things in between as income earning things. But basically, that's it. I've been doing that and now running Shop the Garment District friends own things that I've made for myself as well. There are things that I've featured on my blog that are in friends closets now. That happens often. <laughs> wow. Ah, one thing that I do want to mention is that for a long time, I've made custom garments for clients. And I find that there's an enormous challenge when making, you know, it's like the invisible product. Someone asks you to make something and then you make it. And I've developed such great friendships with past clients through doing this, but it's such an interesting exploration. I'm not sure how I would do it without the garment district and so many choices here. I don't know how people do it in places where they don't have really rich resources for sewing because here we just have so many things. It doesn't mean the projects can't go wrong. You know, I've had plenty of those. I've had plenty of things that have gone very, very right you can never really, you have to sort of dive in and take, take yourself on an adventure and kind of hope that everything turns out well. You can't guarantee it. But I do think that when you think about making things for yourself and making things for other people, if you can approach that with the same passion for each, you're so much better off. It enriches you hmm. in a way. You know, you make something for someone, it's fantastic. And then you think, huh, maybe I want to make something like that for myself, or maybe that's an idea I've never explored because people come with such interesting ideas. You know, someone shows me something that they've loved forever. And they say, is there any way that you can turn this into something I can wear today? And we do that. And it's really just a fantastic exploration. I wish more people were involved in making things for other people because there seems to be such a small group of us who are willing <laughs> It's something people are always looking for. Mm -hmm. I don't know in a, if in Australia, I think you probably have a more active community of people. I, I know there are more sewers in Australia by population. I mean, just percentage wise, it's more common to sew. Uh, yes and no. I think because I sew and I'm very much mm -hmm. part of the sewing community, 
that's what I see. Mm-hmm. But people who are not part yeah. of the sewing community wouldn't have a clue mm. because it's not mm. part of their vision. It's not something that they're interested in. Mm. At the end of the day, if you're wearing clothing and you're not mm-hmm. mindful of what sewing is all about, you won't even put the two together. One and one won't make two to you. Mm. All you'll see is one. Huh. Huh. That's interesting. One thing I love is that, you know, you can look in the closet and find things that not a single copy of that item exists. You know, I made a shirt I call the Ridicu shirt. And there's no other shirt like that shirt. And I love it. You can hate it if you want to. And that's fine. <laughs> but I love it. And that's all that matters. That's one thing I love is the freedom that it doesn't have to respond to fashion in any way. It can just be something that lives because I saw it in my head and it just needed to exist. And it does. That's right. It does. Mm-hmm. And that's all it is. Perfect. Every once in a while, someone will ask me, they'll see me wearing something and they'll say, how long did it take you to make that? Which is a question that I still don't know how to answer because the answer is generally all my life, (laughs) you know, all my life. There's so many things that I've made that take all my life to create. I have fabrics from people who I loved who are, I've always had friends who are much older than I am, you know, like my mother's friends and, you know, and people who sewed who have now passed away, who have given me their stashes. So I have the stash of a woman who was about 100 when she died. And in the 60s, she went to Scotland. And I have these fabrics that are too pretty to touch still. And they don't expire. And I think to myself, there's something there that I can't even... You have to look everywhere. Like inspiration is everywhere. And possibilities are endless. And fabric doesn't expire. And it's so important to think about these things that exist and lead a life beyond the person's life who originally owned it. There was a woman who was over a different person, a woman who died, who was over a hundred fairly recently. I had her stash. A friend of mine had gone through a cancer diagnosis. I gave her a Mobius scarf made out of this beautiful fabric that this woman had bought when she was in Japan. And this fabric is so old and so beautiful and so perfect that it's just amazing how it can just live a new life, you know? And the only reason that it's important with the cancer diagnosis, here's someone who didn't know what she could expect of her future. And here's someone whose days are already done and her fabric is now around her neck, you know, just like, and it makes a beautiful kind of statement on like the circle of life and just the continuing of, I don't know. It's had more than one lifetime. Exactly. And it's kind of what the, it's the part of sewing that I can't articulate, just that it's, it's deeper than just making an item. It's, you have to be process oriented more than product oriented and kind of see the greater, I don't know what it is, the the greater. Well, the value. Yeah. The greater value that it provides. Yeah people so it's had one life it's now gone to you and you pass it on to someone else right and they value it so it's gone through three hands of people who have valued it and it will probably hopefully continue on in some way shape or form adding value to somebody else sounds like you've got a lot of fabrics there that are going to bring lots of value to more people absolutely absolutely and I love doing it and I don't think I'll ever stop. (laughs) So (laughs) I would encourage it. (laughs) That and, you know, I'll I'll put some of the more, the funnier things that I've made lately, I'll put them up on my uh, Instagram so that I can share the jokes of things that I've made because that's been fun. We've had a lot of laughs lately, my friends and I, and (laughs) at things that I've made on purpose, like they're funny on purpose and ideas that I have for things. (laughs) Yes. Thanks, Mimi. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. And have a lovely day, listeners. This episode of Soul Ganai Style Podcast for Sober 50 was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Mimi Jackson, sound by bensound.com. 
You can subscribe to Soul Gunner Style Podcast, but with an S, not a Z, on all good podcast apps. Thank you to everyone who has given us a five-star rating and a wonderful review in the past, and we hope that some of you may be able to help us through our Patreon account to keep this podcast going. There are over 280 free podcasts in our podcast library, and we aim to keep you company and encourage you to sew more often. Post any questions or podcast suggestions you have on our Instagram account at Soul Organized Style or on our website at www.soulorganizedstyle.com or on our Facebook page. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone.